Hey, welcome back. This is Joel Duff. Today, quick episode of Critique and Creationism. Yeah, we're at Creation Ministries International's website, creation.com, and we're going to look at an article by Taz Walker on Southern Mast Weavers. This article is but only six paragraphs long. It's very simple, but it will allow me to make a single issue with Young Earth Creationism that I see all the time. I've pointed it out in the past, but we're going to do it with another example in this case. Taz Walker is, well, he's going to talk about southern mast weavers, uh, which are which is a type of bird. Uh, but you should know that Taz Walker is a, well, he's got a bachelor's degree in earth science, uh, and he has a PhD in mechanical engineering, or uh, some form of engineering. A biologist, he is not. But he doesn't have to go into a whole lot of depth here. He is wowed and amazed by the southern mast weaver. As you should be. I mean, weavers are really cool birds and they do some really interesting things. But his claim about uh, the origins of the southern mast weaver, um, it runs afoul of other messages that are presented by Creation Ministries International, Answers in Genesis, and Institute for Creation Research in terms of the origins of these types of birds and these types of characters. So let's see. What, what do you mean? Joel, what are you talking about? How does this article contradict other young earth creationist literature? Well, let's read this article. It won't take long. Six short, simple paragraphs. The last paragraph is our key. All right, let's get cracking. The multiplication mystery of the southern mast weaver. Hey, you know what? I'm not even going to read the whole thing. I can give you the gist of this article very quickly, and that way we can spend a little more time on the discussion. The gist is this. The southern mast weaver bird, it, it's an incredible bird, right? The male does this amazing job of picking up materials from its environment, weaving them together into this intricate nest. In this case, it's uh, hanging from a tree branch uh, so that the entrance is uh, on the bottom side. So the nest is essentially upside down. So it's just the chamber inside. So you're protected from the elements, right? So protected from the rain. Uh, you have a, it's difficult to get in. So that's going to protect you somewhat from some types of predators. What's the other thing he points out? Oh yeah, he says the timing is one remarkable aspect. The nest must be finished when the female needs to lay her eggs, typically two to five. She then sits on them for 14 days until they hatch. Uh, so how does all this happen? I mean, that's really the question here in this simple little article that is uh, like a daily type of like G whiz type of thing on the creation.com. How is all this possible that uh, this bird could do all these amazing things? So that's where we get to our last paragraph. The question arises, where do these birds learn to weave their nesting masterpiece? How do they know when to begin building or how to care for the chicks? From the very beginning, these weaver beards had to have been proficient in every aspect of parenting or there would not have been a next generation. Ah, that must be the title, right? The Multiplication Mystery of the Southern Mast Weaver. Uh, I guess, like, how do these birds multiply? In other words, I, I guess just I'm trying to come up with a clever way of saying, like, how do they continue to survive? How do they make it from one generation to another? Uh, that's the question here. From the very beginning, these weavers had to be proficient in every aspect of parenting, or there would not have been a next generation. Right. How do they do it? They have to do everything just, do you recognize the irreducible complexity argument here? Right. This is a really complicated system. If anyone, any part of this system didn't work, uh, they, the, bird, the nest wasn't built right. Uh, the, 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 it wasn't built at the right time so that the female was ready to lay its eggs, but the nest wasn't ready, right? If you, if you didn't have this, uh, you know, caring of the young, well, then they wouldn't survive. And maybe sometimes that male has to help to make that happen. Anyway, all these things have to occur in order for the chicks to survive and produce another generation. So how does all that happen? This is another mystery where the Bible makes sense of the world. The knowledge, skills, motivation, and instinct were provided by the Creator Himself in the beginning, when He created these birds on day five of the creation week. There it is. Yet, there's the whole article. These are really amazing birds. They are irreducibly complex. Right? What they do can't be done in a, you know, it, 
if you changed any little bit of their behavior and how they produce their nest, then potentially they wouldn't be able to continue their existence. There's only one possible explanation of that, and that is God made them just like that. Isn't that an impression you get from this particular article? The knowledge, skills, motivation, and instinct, right? The instinct for them to build the nest exactly this way was provided by God himself in the beginning when he created these birds. So I think most readers, and possibly you as you hear this, are getting the impression that uh, Taz Walker believes that God made this specific bird, right? Gave this specific bird its attributes and made them win in the beginning, in the creation week. Now, anyone who's watched my videos knows exactly where I'm going next, right? I've, I mean, surely, if you watch the videos, you know what I'm going to say next. Do I have to say it? Well, I am going to say it because some of you haven't watched my videos and you're wondering, okay, all right, uh, you sucked me into this somehow with this uh, simple story of a interesting bird. And now we know the way it got its features was God created it on the fifth day of creation. Okay, of course, what I'm going to ask is, what about all the other weaver birds? Because there's a whole bunch of species of weaver birds. Right? And they don't all make exactly the same nest. Not all of them make hanging nests. Some make nests not on the ground, but on vegetation uh, and in hollows. All right. They all weave nests in the sense that they collect material from their environment and they they weave some kind of baskety type object, but it's not always an enclosed hanging upside down thing. All right, so that right there raises a big question. Did God make all those different species? Uh, you know, it'd be nice if we actually saw some of those species. Here's the southern mast weaver. Um, nice example of male and female um, dimorphic traits, right? Uh, the bright red, sorry, bright yellow color of the male and more of the drab brown colors of the female, which is pretty common in, in a lot of birds, uh, especially of birds in which the female is going to be the one that's going to be protecting young and raising young, which is mostly the case in the, in the case of the weavers. Uh, and the, the male is using coloration uh, for a variety of other purposes, which is attracting a mate partly. All right, so this is the, yeah, and here's some examples of, of nests, you know, building the nest, right? And this is using whatever available resources there are. So, um, you know, it's, it's a very, it's an amazing innate ability that they have. However, they're crafty in the sense that they build it in different ways depending on the resources that they have. That right there suggests that um, there's a lot of adaptability even within the species to be able to change the shape of the nest, maybe the size of the nest, the, certainly the composition of the nest. Right? These are other Wikipedia images showing a whole bunch of these hanging nests. Yeah, really cool. Cool stuff, right? But what we're interested in, what we're going to do here is I wanted to take this opportunity to show you some of the other weaver birds. And we're going to talk about the diversity of these birds, which then leads to a discussion of, well, what exactly is a kind Right, because that's where we're going. Did 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 God um, create the weaver this specific weaver bird species as it is? Like, gave it that specific set of characteristics? Are they truly irreducibly complex? Because that's kind of the argument Taz Walker is using here. That what I just told you about this specific species is makes it sound like it's irreducibly complex. They have a set of features that no other process could possibly produce. It has to have been designed just like that. And therefore the designer designed it. And the impression you get from this article is that that designer God made this particular species as it is. That design process doesn't include evolutionary mechanisms, right? It doesn't include natural selection. It doesn't include mutation. It doesn't include um, changing allele frequencies and, uh, changing the organism and its environment and how it makes its nest and how it uh, uh, takes care of its young and so forth over time. He's very much sounding like that is not possible. Now, that's not actually the position of Creation Ministries International, which published this particular article. All right. So, so what's going on here? Why the disconnect? All right. So back to these birds first. Uh, I want you to notice that 
this is just one species, right? This species is only found in South Africa. Uh, that species is a member of a genus. So a genus would be a group of species that are very similar to one another, right? They have some, they have a, a common set of, of suite of characteristics. This characteristic that really binds these together is this weaving ability. Although there are other birds that can weave nests, right? So that it's not just the weaver birds that make um, these types of nests. There's other ones that are clearly not related and are different kinds according to Young Earth Creationist. Um, but okay, so let's see. Here we've got um, this genus, which is in what we're going to see is in a larger family, right? Which is a bunch of different kinds of passerine birds, which are all called weavers as well. So there's a genus of weavers that this particular species is in, but that's also in a larger group, which also is characterized by this, by making nests that are generally called weavers. And we're going to look even farther than that in a moment, but let's go to the family, all right? So if I go to the family, Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Stick with the genus. I got to show you how many members are in species uh, in this genus. So here is a bunch of different names of things that have all been assigned to this genus. And you can see some of these pictures now above you here. Uh, you've got all these different great color variations, right? So a lot of variety, you know, and each, each species is pretty consistent in terms of its characteristics. Oh, that's one of the reasons it's a species, right? And they generally don't interbreed uh, with one another. So this is a tremendous amount of variation. They do have common characteristics, obviously. And I think that most young earth creationists would say that God didn't make each one of those species, right? On day five, right? Now, and Taz Walker talked about this thing being made on day five. Did he mean this particular species or did he mean like some more generic type of weaver uh, and then the one he's specifically talking about has formed its particular characteristics much later in time as it is diversified over time and changed over time. That isn't, certainly wasn't the impression I'm sure you got just from that short article. But here you have many, many, many different species, right? Just within this one genome, well, actually, here, this is better, right? Here's each different species and its distribution. It's all African, a, a little bit up into India. Um, so in the, into the Middle East. All right, there you go. Bunch of different varieties. And we're going on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And these make different shaped, uh, they have characteristically different uh, baskets that they make. They're not all hanging. Some are in vegetation uh, and open from the side, not from the bottom. So there's going to be a, a bunch of different variety. They eat, they specialize on different foods. Um, you can see the coloration patterns are different. Their calls are different, right? So a lot of genetic variation there. All right, I got to scroll back up here. Now let's see here. You can see that genus is in this family. So if we go up to this family or subfamily, uh, is a family of small passerine birds. We'll look at the passerine birds in a moment. And that consists of... Wow, all right, we've got all these different genera. And here's here's the genus we're interested in down here, which has 72 different species. Um, and then, you know, 18 species, two species. The sociable weaver is a different kind of weaver right here. Um, that's also found in South Africa. Um, you also have some sparrows, or what is called the sparrow weavers. All right, so here's a bunch of different genera that are all have some similarity to one another. Not sure what that is. We could read about it here. Um, actually, they're not telling us anything really about the characteristics here that are going to help me uh, determine what's common between all these. But okay, so here, here we go. Here's a whole, well, these are all the weavers we just looked at. And they're not going to show every one of them there because you can go to a sub page for that. Uh, and so then here is, you know, more variety. Oh, look at this one. This is a rather famous one here uh, in this particular group. That's the long-tailed uh, widow bird. All right? Fantastic tail, right? Uh, and this one produces a type of, uh, you know, I would not be sure I would characterize that as weaved together. You know, that's more like a robin or something like that where, yeah, sure, it collects a lot of material. Uh, and kind of deposits it, deposits in a way that it becomes this uh, nest. 
Um, I mean, these, these are great birds. They've been studied a lot because the whole question is why the male has that long tail. By the way, the female does not have a long tail. It's just the male. Uh, and so, and they've shown through a bunch of studies, a lot of data has been collected to show that the, the female is choosing longer tails as sort of the thing it's using as its decision-making process for which one's going to be its mate. And that is sexual selection. That is selecting for longer tails. So if you have a population of these birds, these male birds, and some of them have genetic variants that make longer tails, well, they have an advantage, right? Females choosing them, they have more, they have, they, their eggs are going to be, are going to include their genes. And therefore the next generation is going to have slightly longer tails. All right. And so that's, that's this thing where, it's, where selection continues to produce these really elaborate, crazy traits. And that's what can happen in, in uh, sexual selection. All right, but but this the, the whole point here for our purposes is that this bird is in the same family as that other weaver bird that Taz Walker is talking about. Uh, and we can continue to go out. We go out to the Passerformes, um, which is a, the really large bird, uh, group of songbirds, and it's huge, right? We have 6,500 different species and 140 different families. Now, young earth gracious often make the family the, uh, the the kind, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment. Uh, but if you come down here and look at the passiformes and look at the subgroups of those, um, sorry, yeah, go to the songbirds, all right? And we look in the songbirds, we'll see that the songbirds include all these different families, right? Which include the Passeridae, and in the Passeridae we have the Passeroidae, a sub super family. I'm sorry, a super family, not a sub family. Super family would be like kind of like bigger than a family, and then you have like sub families within that. And so I, I know that was confusing. We're, we're going taxonomically a bunch of different levels here. The thing is, there's just so many songbirds. All right, Passeriformes. Uh, that they've had to break them down into lots of subgroups. Um, there's just, you know, it's not enough to just have an order and a family and a genus and a, and a species. Uh, but here's, here's the thing I want to show you. Superfamily Passeroidae. Uh, smallish herb of, you know, mostly smallish herbivores, meaning they eat plant material. Near global distribution, uh, often pronounced sexual dimorphism, meaning the, the males are very colorful. Um, and they, they really are some of the most colorful birds alive. Songs tend to be fairly simple, warbling and chirping, right? These are your songbirds. These are the things you hear when you wake up in the morning. All right, now we're gonna, we're gonna look down in here and we see the Passeroidae. That's one of these groups within here. And what does the Passeroidae include? It includes the weavers. So we're just looking at the group the weavers are within in a different way here. Um, and so this would be the family that includes all those different genera I just showed you a moment ago. So like some uh, 150 or so different species eventually. Uh, so those are the generally called the weavers, but you also have the Passeridae, which is the true sparrows. There's a lot of sparrows, right? Um, and then you have, well, you've got finches. All right, and we have cardinals and buntings, American sparrows, tanagers, warblers, New World warblers, other tanagers, all right, the orioles. These are all really familiar birds to a lot of people, all right? All of these are in one big group that uh, doesn't say here, but this is hundreds and hundreds, probably uh, most likely more than a thousand species. Uh, of birds. Why am I showing you all this? Ah, I'm showing you all this so I can show you this. Uh, we're looking at a photo, photo of a display, all right, in the Ark Encounter. So here we, over on the side here, you might see that you have deck one, deck two, deck three. Uh, that's, that's a signage for the Ark Encounter, the, the uh, Answers in Genesis theme park of showing you like what they think it was like on the on Noah's Ark. Uh, and so they're, they're um, talking about, they actually have this board that has, here's all the different kinds of organisms that Noah brought in the Ark. Because remember, Noah had to bring representatives of each kind, biblical kind. So God created 
kinds of organisms on day five, like kinds of birds and kinds of reptiles and so forth. And he, well, kinds of birds on day five, reptiles on day six. And those kinds then, all of those land living vertebrate organisms had to be preserved by Noah, right? And in within the young earth creationist interpretation of Genesis one through 11. And so they would say that, uh, so they've tried to identify what all the different kinds are that God created that had to have been on Noah's Ark. And you, you can probably see where I'm going to go with this. Let's scroll in to flying creatures. All right. These are the things that Noah had on his Ark. Uh, here's some reptiles that are extinct that were flying. Yeah, what are those? You know, like uh, uh, pterodactyls. So all the different pterosaurs. And they're agreeing that there's many different families of pterosaurs. And so each, there must have been a representative of each of those pterosaurs on the Ark. Now, of course, they're all extinct. So they were preserved on Noah's Ark, but then they all went extinct. And then they agree that there are extinct types of bats or kinds of bats. And there are a bunch of living kinds of bats. All right. So they are suggesting there could have been a lot of different kinds of bats on the Ark. And then we get down to birds, right? Uh, and so there's lots of extinct lineages of birds that don't exist today. Um, some of these would be, um, some of these are going to sound like dinosaurs because they represent the bird-like dinosaurs. But what we're most interested in looking at are the living birds, right? What types of living birds are there? Well, you know, they actually have representatives of some of those on the ark that you can see. Um, although the Ark, Noah's Ark, actually had all these on it, and so presumably they could have made an Ark that had every one of these animals on it to show us how they would all fit. Uh, they actually only have representatives of a few of the different uh, Ark kinds. And so we see, you know, corvids, actually, which are uh, ravens and blue jays. We have galliforms, uh, it's like chickens. Ah, this is what I wanted to see right here. Passeroidae. Passeroidae. Now, didn't I just show you the Passeroidae? That was that big list. That was the super family, right? And the super family included sparrows, finches, cardinals, ah, and the, all the weavers, all multiple genera of things that are called weavers. And then the specific genus of weavers that the species that Taz Walker is talking about, which is a weaver. They are listing that as a kind. Right? So what Answers in Genesis is saying, and I think that Creation Ministries International would generally agree with this as well, that there is a large group of species on this earth, a thousand different species around us that are living. There's many different pastoral that have gone extinct as well. Um, but of those, all those thousand, they were only represented by a couple birds, right? Two birds on the ark. Because there was just one kind that God created of a passeroide. He might have created a lot of diversity in different types of passeroide as like instantaneously on day five. But when it came to Noah's Ark, only two of those birds out of however many passeroides were alive at that time, you know, if there was a billion of them alive, only two of them survived. And those two then had to have become weavers and cardinals and sparrows right and baltimore orioles and tanagers and you know all those other things we taught we i showed you mm, wow right and do they all weave nests mm, they all make some kind of nests do they make hanging upside down ones that are like irreducibly complex <laughs> apparently not right those two birds on the ark if they were irreducibly complex they had a particular date in which they're going to they in, you know they innately innately knew this is the day we need to reproduce and this is the material we have to pick up and this is the type of nest that we make right those two birds you know went out and they had to reproduce and in order for them to reproduce they had to do something very specific like that then how did they have offspring that eat different foods and live in different environments and make different kinds of nests uh, and use different resources and have different songs uh, and so on and so forth. 
and look like they're also irreducibly complex in terms of their characteristics. Right? This is the disjunct in young earth creationism is that they, I see this all the time. They want to talk about how the giraffe is, giraffe's nef, neck is so incredibly designed, it couldn't have evolved. It couldn't have adapted and changed from another type of organism. But then you go to the ark and you find out the giraffe is on the ark. Hey, you know what? We could do that right here, maybe. Um, mammals, living. Uh, giraffes, there they are right there. The giraffidae, right? That's the family giraffes. You know what else is in that particular family? The okapi, uh, which has a short neck. All right, so the long neck can't be irreducibly complex if the organism that was on the ark had a short neck. And that's what they show on the ark. They show an organism with a short neck that then grew a longer neck after the ark, after they departed from the ark. So apparently there are intermediate steps between a short neck and a long neck, and they were able to adapt and change the characteristics of their neck in order to have all the amazing, unique features they have with a long neck. Uh, that, and there's actually dozens and dozens of other species in the fossil record of giraffes, um, of which none of them have necks. Well, actually, I think there is an extinct version of giraffes that also has long neck, but most of them have short necks. All right, so that's... Um, uh, you know that 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 just again I mean, we could we could go all over this thing and show that that's the case, right? Some of these are are absolutely humongous uh, families that include hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of species with incredible diversity. Uh, and so, but I could show you article after article after article in young Earth creationist literature, which which holds up a particular species and its characteristics as so amazing that. Um, it had to have been created like just as it is. Those two things don't fit together. Now, um, let's see. To be fair, because I I know creationists who uh, I I think I I think what they'll say is, Joel, look, yeah, I mean you're right. The the pers the it, it, this looks like. We're saying that this thing was designed just the way it is. Like, that's the way God made it exactly. But when we say designed, and we say that these are amazing features, we're saying that those are somehow built into the original organism. They had all the information they needed in order to make those characteristics, and that those characteristics would be expressed maybe later. So if you were at that moment, God created that particular bird, uh, right? You know, or God created Passeroides, right? Here we go the Passeroidea, right? And he might've created hundreds of birds on day five that are all in that particular kind of organism. And they had a, a bunch of different varieties. Um, so maybe God did create one that made baskets and made one that did something else and made some, and the other, and, and, a, and a finch and, a, and a something like a cardinal, right? But they were all part of the same kind, which means they could interbreed and they could adapt and change with each other. And yeah, sure enough, right, Noah could only have brought two of them on the ark, but somehow in those two, they still maintained like the genetics, the information inside of those two birds for making 50 different kinds of nests. And then their offspring relearned or got the right exact combination of, of alleles again, separated into separate groups that then were allowed them to make hanging basket versus you know a ground basket versus one that's sitting in a tree like a sparrow and um that all of that was actually inside of that organism so they all had the capacity to do it now that's not really the way that taz walker's article reads you know he's he's making it sound like these are specific characteristics that this species has and you can't change any of those or the species would not would blink out of existence. Well, then that's the same problem you'd have when the birds got off the ark and they had to disperse and they have to reproduce. Um, how are they reproducing if every single offspring they have has new characteristics? Like, how do they find a mate when one of them's trying to make one nest, but the mate is, you know, the female's looking for a different sort of characteristic because it's not looking for a basket it's looking for uh, a different kind of nest um, and the coloration of the birds is all they're all different in the same family 
Uh, and so they're attracted to one color, but the other one is loses out. I mean, it's incredibly inefficient, uh, you know, um, way to uh, reproduce your own kind, right? Um, so this is what I've never, I've never really heard a young earth creationist go through a scenario about like, okay, you got these two birds, and here's what happened in the next generation. Here's what could have happened in the next generation, other than the incredibly simplistic. Ken Ham, you had you've got two canines and they have two alleles and one's for shaggy hair and one's for short hair. And you know, so you have some dogs that got the shaggy hair and some got the long hair. And the ones that were shaggy hair living up north were like, Yay, it's not I can handle the cold. And the 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 other dogs that had the short hair are living where it's warmer and they're like, Yay, fine, I don't have long hair. So now you end up with two different kinds of canines that have two different external characteristics. That's two characteristics, two alleles, not you know hundreds of alleles at uh, for any particular uh, polygenetic trait. Um, that is just an overly simplistic example that does not at all go toward explaining this irreducibly complex sort of system that that they want to argue exists in things like giraffes and um, and these particular uh, weaver birds. Okay, so yeah, there's just a whole lot of birds in the Passeroidae and Anthrus and Genesis is saying that all of these you just you just I I I'm not gonna take the time here because this has already spent a lot too much time but all of these are amazing birds right but they're very different than the weaver birds so you know let's just take a look at the the wax finches I mean that's not a weaver bird and um all of these finches you've seen and you've seen finches you know maybe you've seen their nests and the way they raise their young and so forth they're not weavers right in any of the same way um and yet answers in genesis is saying that this bird right here right just four thousand years ago was the same thing as a weaver bird or it was the same thing as that bird that had the super long tail right or let's just pick out another one no good pictures there. Uh, here's some uh, tanagers. I like tanagers. Oh, here's here's a bunch of variety in tanagers. 240 species of brightly colored fruit-eating birds. Well, uh, these are fruit-eating birds, um, and they're neotropical. Right? So look at the distribution. 240 different species, and they're all in the New World, and all exclusively Central and South America, not North America. Interesting distributions as well. And we could go on about that, the biogeography of these things. Um, okay, I think that that's, uh, that's it. Let's go back and look at our original article. So, multiplication mystery of the southern mast weaver. I don't think there really is any mystery uh, here. Um, Taz Walker, like I said, he's way out of his element in terms of describing this. I think he's just, you know, he's fascinated by um, these cool birds, and I am too, but... To say that, let's read it again. Maybe, uh, maybe this time it'll hit me different. This is another mystery where the Bible makes sense. Of the world, the knowledge, skills, motivation, and instincts were, and instinct were provided by the Creator Himself in the beginning when He created birds on day five. Right? How did these birds lean, learn to weave their nesting masterpiece? How did they know when to begin building or how to care for their chicks? I mean, I guess he could be thinking these birds, like all weaver species. Right? They had to be proficient in every aspect of parenting or they would not be another generation. The knowledge, skills, motivation, and instinct were provided by the Creator Himself. Yeah, so there you have it. The Multiplication Mystery of the Southern Mass Weaver by Taz Walker. And it just always hits me that um, these amazing examples of design are then mixed with there's this huge amount of variety of different disparate characteristics that somehow have to have all come from a single organism or just a few individuals and so somehow become all these different dramatically different characteristics across different parts of the world um, that is a whole lot of evolution and that's why we say that young earth creationists are are hyper evolutionists or uh, super believe in super rapid adaptation and evolution uh, beyond the wildest dreams of any evolutionary biologist all right hey Thanks for hanging out with me. Um, you know, smash that like button and uh, follow this channel if you haven't already for other content that's 
hopefully very diverse and not always just like this. But until next time, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.